Welcome everyone, in this video we will talk about a ball falling through the earth and what it has to do with circular motion. So let's get started. First of all, I want to give a brief outline of what we will do in this video. First, we start off by assumptions. There are mainly three assumptions that we make. First of all, we assume that earth is a sphere to be able to carry out the calculations more easily. Second of all, we assume that Earth has a constant mass density. And finally, we assume that there is not any friction while the ball is falling through the Earth. Then we will visualize the process because I know it may not sound that obvious when I say a ball falling through the Earth. So we will clarify its meaning. Then we will model the motion of the ball. So first, we will solve for the gravitational field inside the Earth using Gauss's law for gravitation. Then we will identify how the derived equation indicates a simple harmonic motion. And then from that point, we will determine the period of the motion. Afterwards, we will refer to Kepler's third law to draw connections between simple harmonic motion and uniform circular motion. So here we go. So basically, this is the picture that we have. There is a very tiny tunnel, let's say, that goes across the earth. And from one end of that tunnel, we release a ball and we expect it to come uh, from the other side, right? So our goal is to show that the period to fall through the earth is the same as traveling around it in a circular orbit. This means that the mass will move to the other side of the earth and then it will come back to the initial position and when that happens we say a period has passed and i claim that that time that period is the same if it were to travel around the earth at a at an altitude of nearly zero so it was if it was to be like newton's cannon just above the ground okay but of course claiming this is one thing and actually showing it is another thing. And we will show it to be true. So here is Gauss's law for gravitation. And we will go step by step about what this is. So we have a weird looking integral. It is a closed surface integral. It is used to calculate the surface area of a shape. Then we have dA, which you can see here. It is a very small area section. It is an infinitesimal area. And by using the surface integral, we will be adding all of these under the integral sign. Then the, there is g sub n, which is the component of gravitational field that is perpendicular to the surface. Then we have the universal gravitation constant. This is the same thing that appears in Newton's law of gravity. Then we have the mass inside. And I will get to the meaning of this in a couple of minutes, hopefully. We have a negative sign. We have an equal sign, we have the number 4, and we have pi. It is not 3, it is not 3.14 or 3.1415, it is pi. Here we go. So how can we solve for gravitational field G inside the Earth? Well, for that we choose an imaginary surface, which you can see indicated by this little dash here, dashed line here. And this is sometimes called a Gaussian surface. So that's, let's say, uh, how we name it. A Gaussian sphere, maybe. It looks like a circle, of course, but in fact, this is 3D, of course. So I basically rewrote the gravitational, uh, gravitational law of Gauss for... Uh, excuse me. I rewrote law, Gauss's law for gravity. This is the first line. And then I say that the the perpendicular component of the gravitational field is the gravitational field itself. And why is that? Because dA, these area vectors, they point perpendicular to the surface and they point away from the surface. And so if, if we use the surface of the Gaussian sphere that we have, we know that the dA at this point, maybe it will be upwards and the gravitational field, well, it will be due to symmetry, it will be radially outwards, I mean inwards, excuse me, it will be radially inwards. And so that is basically how we get 
well, how we get the fact that gn is equal to g because it is in the direction of the dA completely. And also for any point on the sphere, on the Gaussian sphere, the distance from the center is the same and it is all symmetric, which means that the gravitational field strength does not change. So we can basically take it out of the integral sign. And then we have the integral of dA, infinitesimal dA is added. Well, that is just going to be the surface area of a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. This is equaling negative 4 pi g mass inside. We simplify by 4 pi to get g r squared equaling negative g mass inside. Cool. Then we want to solve for the mass inside and substitute for it. Now, the way it works is like this. And this is where the one of the assumptions that the Earth has constant mass density comes into play. We are saying the total volume of 4 over 3 pi capital R cubed corresponds to a total mass of N. But I don't want that mass. I want the mass inside the Gaussian surface. So, I use the little r this time, and it will give mass inside. And from this, then, we can see that mass inside is equal to little r cubed over capital R cubed times mass, the mass of the earth. And then, if we substitute for it, we get that g is equal to negative uh, g over uh, times m over capital R cubed times r. So, it is a linear function of the distance from the, the center of the earth. Now, how does this co correspond to simple harmonic motion? Well, we know that in simple harmonic motion, we could say the only force acting will be mg, which is for, for the points inside the earth is negative g, well, the quantity that you're seeing. And then we also note that the force of gravity is zero when r is zero, which means that this is the equilibrium point. We also know that from simple harmonic motion, f is equal to negative kx. And so you can obviously see the connection because x is the displacement from the equilibrium and r is the displacement from the equilibrium. So we are able to see that throughout the motion, the ball's displacement is... So the force that acts on the ball is proportional with its displacement from the center of the world, center of the earth. Which means that the coefficient of r will be k. Hence, k is equal to g times mm divided by r cubed. We also know that for simple harmonic motion, the period is given by this formula. So if we substitute for k and if we square both sides, we get that t squared is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed over gm. And you might be saying, why did you square both sides? My friends, I squared both sides because it gives Kepler's third law, which means the periods are the same. If the ball travels around the earth, around the earth just above the ground, or if it just moves through a tunnel back and forth, the period of the motion is the same. Which is pretty cool, I think. So numbers for fun, uh, it would reach four. It would take forty-two minutes to reach the other side, and also without assuming constant mass density, we get a more realistic result. I don't know how realistic something can be in this setup, but thirty-seven minutes is more realistic if we don't assume constant mass density. And there is a YouTube video actually which goes over it. I watched it while preparing for this video. That's why I want to include it. It's not any of my, it's not a, a video of mine. It is a video of someone else, which I enjoyed. So as a summary, we showed that a ball falling through the earth is in simple harmonic motion because the force is uh, opposite in direction with the displacement from the equilibrium. And it is also uh, proportional to the magnitude of the uh, displacement. In our derivation, we used Gauss's, Newton's, and Kepler's laws, 
And finally, we showed that the period of the falling motion is the same as a circle orbit just above the surface of the Earth, which would be uh, Newton's canon. And here we have a very interesting quote by Richard Feynman from his book, The Character of Physical Law. It says, Nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns, so each small piece of our fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. For me, this quote means in, in relation to the presentation of this video, uh, I think it means that uh, lots of ideas in physics are actually very intertwined with each other. We have simple harmonic motion and we have uniform circular motion. They might seem like unrelated at first, at first glance, but when you go into detail, you see that they are very, very closely related. And in fact, the, well, you could say that the simple harmonic motion is the projection of a circular motion to a plane. We could discuss these in further detail, but I just want to leave it here with this inspiring quote, hopefully. And also, let's show the sources. These are all the sources that I used while preparing for this video. Anyways, I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions, please add them in the comment section. I hope to see you in another video. Until then, take care. Also, please subscribe. Thanks.